This video is sponsored in part by Curiosity Stream. I'm Mr. Beats, and will win the next presidential election. Part of the reason why I am saying that is because Ethan from the channel Let's Talk Elections has predicted that. Who do you think is going to win the election? I think that is going to win the presidential election. So we both know that will win the next presidential election. But what if we could go back in American history and change the outcomes of previous presidential elections? Can we obtain such power? <laughs> Ethan and I dorked out recently by playing a game called The Campaign Trail. It's on a website called American History USA, and in it you basically just pretend like you are different candidates running for president in real historical presidential elections. You can pretend to be real candidates and get to choose your running mate. You answer questions about your platform and positions and choose which states to visit. There are lots of alternate history possibilities. We both chose to play the election of 2016 and the election of 2012 and two other elections of our choice and then we met up to compare our results all right so yeah let's get into our results of the game i think we should start with the 2016 election i played one on the plane today because i tried to win on impossible mode and i did i won on impossible mode. you are so much yeah i i failed every time <laughs> really i am horrible at this game <laughs> these are all of our choices we got 2016, 2016 alternate version, 2012, 2000, 1988, 1976, 1968, 1960, 1948, 1916, 1996, 1817, 1818, 1914. I've seen some people do like landslides on impossible mode, so. What are your opinions of this game? Uh, well, this game is pretty binary, but there's four options. The certain answers that you give aren't the ones that I necessarily think are the best. Some of them sort of lock you in a um, I found that this game does put you in difficult positions, so it's not like there's a perfect response, which I think is good, but also it's hard to gauge where you are. I'm gonna look at the one where I lost when I used Tim Kaine. I think I was hit with a couple of scandals as Hillary Clinton, and then also at points where, when I was at, at that point running against Donald Trump, when he had said certain things, that I also had to respond to them in a correct manner. There were certain times where I responded and it said, you shouldn't have responded that way. You should have focused on your attributes or you should have doubled down on him. So there were some certain things where uh, I felt it was difficult for me to get the right answer, but it was a pretty cool experience. Yeah, I had fun playing them. I just was horrible at them. Turns out that you'll be running against Trump, likely with a significant fundraising advantage. Those are the advisors there. <laughs> the FBI director, James Comey, has handed down a severe criticism of your email practices while Secretary of State though he declined to recommend any indictments. Do you have any comments? <clears throat> mm, I'm gonna go with, I use the same email practices as Colin Powell and many other people in government. Sometimes what you think that they should have done that could have changed the election actually may have ended up hurting them more than yeah, I, mean, I had Bernie Sanders run with Hillary Clinton, but it seems like a lot of the progressive voters were just not buying it. The differences between us are much smaller than the things that unite us. I think the first one, we can't deny Bernie Sanders enjoys a huge amount of support. And especially because I was talking out of both sides of my mouth answering the questions because I was still not trying to lose the moderates mm -hmm. <laughs> and trying to even to reach some conservatives and it just did not work out. At the end of the day, anytime I did try to appease the progressive base, which I thought would help me, it didn't end up actually helping me as much as I thought it did. And I really had to stick with that sort of moderate message. You did another 2016 one. How'd that one go? So I chose Julian Castro as my running mate this time because oh, good one. he seemed to be the favorite. Uh, I remember, well, I was in eighth grade, so I didn't pay that much attention. I was watching it closely and I was looking at the CNN articles talking about who could be the the VP pick, and then uh, Julian Castro was, I think, ranked number one. I just wanted to see what a, te a reality would have been. I didn't visit Texas at all, even though that's his home state. I visited Florida and also the Rust Belt, and I think I gave a little bit of attention to um, Arizona, just because that was a state that the Clinton campaign did try to make a play for. Um, and I ended up winning on impossible mode with 308 electoral votes. Uh, Trump got 230. Uh, I just uh -huh. retained all the Obama states except for Iowa and Ohio. So All right, let's check out the results. Looks like, well, I did a little bit better than actually uh, how um, she did with the Electoral College, but it looks like he uh, gained some ground with the popular vote. 2012, it did not go well for me as well. So for Mitt Romney's running mate, I did not have Paul Ryan. So I had Marco Rubio run running with 
Mitt Romney. Uh, I ended up with 235 electoral votes for Mitt Romney and Obama had 303. And looking at the actual results, that was a lot better. Uh, in the actual 2012 election, Obama had 332 electoral votes and Romney had 206. In the popular vote, I got more as well. But I think ultimately, I think there was just a lot of momentum on Obama's side being the incumbent. I was torn between like, you know, should I go all in with attacking Obama or should I try to have more of a big tent? And because uh, that was the whole idea with running Rubio as my running mate. Honestly, I think if I would have gone more in with the attacking Obama, I would have had more success. This is the one where I tried to do everything wrong for Obama's half. I played oh. as Obama with Biden. And I ended up losing. Oh. Uh, I ended up losing with 152 electoral votes. I, I pretty much just answered the questions in the worst way possible. I won New York and I won California, but I lost Connecticut and Oregon. And Whoa! I lost Oregon. New Jersey and Delaware, which is Biden's home state. I lost Delaware by 0.7. So I must have done something really bad. But good um, job. Yeah. <laughs> One of my responses was something about Nixon, where um, I think I was accused of doing something towards the Romney campaign, and I just answered it saying like, didn't Richard Nixon invent this strategy question mark? And it was two answers that I could have done. And I think one, I, I think, I think they're giving it to me as sort of like a, you know, you can escape. There's another one with Minnesota. And I think I blame something on like the Canadian border. I did the 1988 election because I was, I knew that Michael Dukakis had a pretty bad campaign overall. Like if he would have focused more on pointing the finger at Bush senior and associate him more with the negative stuff of Reagan, I think he would have had more success. And I try to do that when I played the game. This is the one where I did worse. Actually, George H.W. Bush got 472. This is the one where I, my own bias was, was, uh, I think hardest to ignore because I kept answering questions as if like, well, yeah, the death penalty is bad because I'm personally against the death penalty. And today that's kind of the national dialogue. But back in the 1980s, more people, more Americans were for the death penalty. And yeah. so, oh, I ran with Jesse Jackson too, I should add. And that was a, another reason why I didn't do very well because Jesse Jackson was apparently too far to the left. So I did the election of 1860, which is pretty much my favorite election in American history, just because it was so consequential. <laughs> Obviously, a war resulted from the election. When a presidential election is a direct cause of a civil war, then yeah, it's kind of a big deal. I wanted to try to keep the country together, so I, I chose Stephen Douglas running against Abraham Lincoln. They don't let you do the other candidates. But for folks who don't remember, Abraham Lincoln only won the North. He wasn't even on the ballot in the South. Vice presidential candidate was for Stephen Douglas was a guy named James Guthrie, who was Secretary of the Treasury under Franklin Pierce. He was from Kentucky, a border state that owned slaves, but also was a strong unionist. And it was a lot of like kind of me just taking a soft stance on positions in order not to disillusion any voters. A lot of Southern voters, I was just, it was just lost, so I didn't focus on them. Like they're not going to vote for me anyway. Mm -hmm. So I mo mostly was just like, oh, Lincoln was this, he's a radical, okay? I think the results ended up being very similar to what how it actually yeah. went. However, I did get him two more electoral votes, so I was proud of that. I got him 14 electoral votes, and he only actually got 12 in real life. So so you did play the, did you play the election in 1960? Yeah, this is the one that I have up, but um, the problem was I chose Herbert Humphrey as my running mate. Essentially, they told me that because I chose him that I completely pushed away the South. And there's this other guy who was in the race. His last name's Bird. I think it's Robert Bird. Robert Bird, yeah. He was yeah. a segregationist. Did you play any other elections? I mean, I've been using this website since like 2017. So I'm pretty <laughs> sure I've, I've played like a fair share of them, but I don't have my results with me. That's okay. Um, what, what's one that you remember? I think 2000. It was very weird because you're working with like a Clinton map four years prior. And this this reshaped the entire electoral map after Bush's first election. So, okay, okay. As fun as playing the campaign trail is, the game surprisingly does a mediocre job at emphasizing the most important thing that predicts election results. After this brief and awkward cut to this video sponsor, I will explain what that thing is. But first, maybe pause the video and type it in the comments to see if you got it right. If you are watching this, you like learning. So hey, did you know that there's a wonderful place on the internet where there's nothing but fascinating educational content? That'd be Curiosity Stream. It's smart TV for your smart TV. Ha ha ha. Get it? 
Anyway, Curiosity Stream has thousands of streamable documentaries and non-fiction, award-winning exclusive TV shows on topics like history, nature, science, food, technology, travel, and more. With more than 35 collections of curated programs handpicked by their experts. Stream to any device, anytime. I recommend the series American Icons to start off with. Try it out by visiting the link on the screen and in the description of this video. Use code MrBeat to sign up and get it for just $14.99 for the whole year. Thanks to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this video. Okay, what's the most important outcome determining an election? It's the economy, stupid. It's the economy, stupid. It's the economy, stupid. It's the economy, stupid, right? At the strongest economy in the history of our country. No matter what the election is, even this one, the thing that people care about the most is whether or not they can put food on the table. And if you just look at the economic data, you can predict who will win the next election. But which economic data? Well, first of all, we only have fairly reliable economic data since the 1940s. Second, it's always about comparing that data. Comparing data from the election year to the data from the year before the election. So what do we look at? Nate Silver once put together a set of 43 economic indicators and ranked them by how reliable they were predicting the next president. At the top of the list, the ISM Manufacturing Index. Obviously, the ISM Manufacturing Index. Wait, what's the ISM Manufacturing Index? Apparently, that's a way to measure manufacturing activity based on a monthly survey by the Institute for Supply Management, or ISM. Okay, so who are these folks taking this survey? purchasing managers at more than 300 different manufacturing companies. So is it safe to say that if the ISM manufacturing index has gone up since the last election, then the incumbent gets reelected? And if it's gone down, the challenging candidate gets elected? Well, not quite. Silver admitted that all of those indicators were individually not that great at predicting who would win the election. However, we do have some economic rules that work quite well well. First, there's the real GDP per capita growth rule, which basically is that the incumbent political party usually wins if the growth rate of real GDP per capita is increasing at a higher rate in the election year compared to the previous year. Well, it's been going down since last year. That doesn't bode well for President Trump. Now, wait a second. What about the misery index rule? The misery index rule says the incumbent usually wins if the misery index has not not gone up in the election year compared to the previous year. Wait, Misery Index? That sounds like something from a Stephen King book. Eh, the Misery Index is simply adding together the rate of inflation and the unemployment rate. Get it? High inflation plus high unemployment equals economic misery. So yeah, you want a low Misery Index, obviously. The average inflation rate in 2019 was 1.8%, and the unemployment rate was 3.6%, giving us a Misery Index that year of 5.4. Based on the latest available data, we currently have a 1.4% inflation rate rate and an unemployment rate of 7.9%, giving us a current misery level index of 9.3. The misery index has gone up by 3.9. Again, not looking good for President Trump. This leads us to the guaranteed loss rule. The guaranteed loss rule says if both the real GDP per capita goes down in the election year compared to the previous year, and the misery index has gone up in the election year compared to the previous year, the incumbent will lose. Based on the GDP per capita data, the inflation rate data, and the unemployment rate data going back all the way to the 1940s, the guaranteed loss rule has never failed to predict who will be the president. That's why they call it the guaranteed loss rule. So based on the data we currently have, it does look like Joe Biden will win the election. I think that Joe Biden is gonna win the presidential election. Throw out everything else. It's the economy, you silly goose. Thanks to Ethan from the YouTube channel, Let's Talk Elections for collaborating with me for this video. It was fun to play that game, The Campaign Trail. I've been watching Ethan's channel since 2016, back when he was just a kid. Okay, he's still just a kid, but 
He is incredibly insightful and always has a really wise analysis for someone his age. Be sure to check out his election video he just released at the same time as this one and be sure to subscribe to his channel, Let's Talk Elections. Fair warning, I may or may not be in his video as well. So who do you think will win the election? Can we really trust the economic data? Let me know in the comments below and happy election day to you.